Hello, everybody. Welcome to the bullpen. Uh, today, I have an ex-teammate and friend of mine, Jose Vasquez, who is now the uh, strength and conditioning coach for the Texas Rangers. And uh, Jose, thanks for joining me, man. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. So, um, you know, a lot of things going on, but I just kind of wanted to kind of catch up and get your kind of journey through baseball to where you are now. You know, I, I know it probably started when you were a kid. You had a passion or a love for baseball, so you kind of want to just take me from there, take us from from where it started. Uh, yeah. Um, growing up in Puerto Rico, I mean, basically, you, all you do is play sports. You're out on out on the street in the neighborhood playing different sports, basketball, riding bikes, playing stickball. Uh, so you know, baseball was kind of a mainstay. That's it. That's everybody did it. You know, everybody played stickball some somewhere or another. Um, and, you know, of course, my dad signed me up for Little League and and I played there. Um, at that time, I never really I didn't have that big love for baseball. I didn't I didn't I didn't really think I was that good. But um, I do remember always having a desire to be a better athlete, whatever it was, whatever, whatever we were playing, I, I always stopped to try to figure out how can I do this better? How can I go faster? How can I get stronger? How can I do it a little bit more efficient? Uh, so it, it always, uh, any kind of athletic movement, any kind of activity I got into, I always had that mentality that I wanted to figure out how to make it better. Uh, and I would always just dive in and just with my own intelligence or smarts at the time, I just try to figure it out. And and uh, but baseball seemed to be the one that always remained and always took me from one place to another. Right. So did so you, you played sports as you were a kid. And then at some point, did it just was it like baseball? Wow. So I got to high school or, you know, it was a middle school or, or what, what like what age was it like? OK, I'm going to focus on this now. Actually, uh, <laughs> baseball didn't really come into picture uh, or it didn't become serious until my senior year in high school. Wow. I, uh, okay. Yeah, because when when we moved from Puerto Rico to Miami, my middle school years, I uh, I wanted to play football, and so I I I started playing football, uh, pee wee. I can't remember what it was called now, but uh, I would play football, baseball, and yeah. a lot of my friends played both. And football seemed to be a big deal in that Miami area where we where we lived, and. Uh, and because I always had the desire, I, I always, I fell in love with weightlifting, weight training when I was like 10 years old. I, I always wanted to have muscles, you know, okay. like that, that's the way I, th I thought about it. I wanted to have muscles and uh, any magazine, any book I could get my hands on. I was reading about exercise and because football and football, you know, bigger, faster, stronger, you, you begin to yeah. lift weights and do push-ups and squats and, well, and yeah. exercising for sport. And so that that idea of training for sport always kind of appealed to me. And what did you play? I'm sorry. What position did you play? Oh, I played receiver. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I could run a little bit. I didn't know what I was doing, but I could run a little bit. Um, and then, um, you know, in, in baseball, you, it, we just picked up the ball, started playing catch, and warmed up, and we played. And so, okay, so so be it, whatever. And um, but the idea of training for the sport always appealed to me, lining up, stretching together, all that stuff. For whatever reason, I liked all that stuff. Um, and so when I, when I went to high school, again, I signed up for football, football uh, and baseball. And I seemed to be a little bit better at football than I was at baseball. And then, um, but my my junior year, I, I discovered that I needed glasses. <laughs> And uh, and so for, again, just one of those things that happen in your life, I realized, man, I need glasses. So I got glasses and lo and behold, I started seeing the baseball at the plate. And so I started hitting and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, I can do this. Um, and so I started hitting a lot better. Um, and so baseball became a little bit more appealing because in football I was doing well, but I was getting banged up. And I'm thinking, you know, not many Puerto Ricans in the NFL. So I, 
it, my my mindset started shifting toward baseball because I seemed to kind of have picked up the knack for hitting the ball. And I was like, okay, let's, let's do this. And so I started looking into the next step, going to junior college, you know, Florida had a lot of good junior colleges. Yeah. And I, yeah. This would be a good transition. And so right around my senior year is basically when, when baseball kind of clicked. And, and so that's, that's really what happened. And then and at that point, were you, what position were you playing? Outfield, right field. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, I kind of, so my junior year, I went, I, I grew up playing second base. So I was, I was an infielder. I wanted to play second base. You know, that my favorite players in the big leagues at that time were second basemen. So I wanted to play second base, but going into high school, there was an upperclassman that was really good. He was a second baseman. So I wasn't going to be able to start at second base until my senior year. So I was like, well, I need to move position. So I moved to third base. And I, I developed the yips. And so for whatever reason, I'm going to throw the ball at the first base. Okay. And, and so they moved me to first and that wasn't any better. Uh, and so they put me in right field and I figured out how to hit the cutoff man. And so there we went. And, but at the same time I was hitting. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm hitting, um, who cares? I, I'll play whatever. So I just right. moved to the outfield and never, never thought about it again. That's cool. That's cool. And so you were in high school, you, you, you went the junior college route. I did the same thing. And so what, and you're right. I mean, Florida, especially back in the late eighties, early nineties, man, everybody down there played awesome junior college mm-hmm. ball. So what, what, what was your, what did, did, when you came out of high school, did you have different options where you just always, always stuck on or, or wanted to go to junior college or what was your thought pattern there? Well, um, I guess this is a good, uh, lesson for all kids because I went through this with my daughter trying to explain to her how sometimes you got to do your own legwork Mm -hmm. Uh, you know when it comes to sports there's always a a small percentage of elite athletes that everybody wants the rest of us the rest of us I think we need to hustle and try to make phone calls now nowadays is emails and text and whatever and try to inquire from whatever school you're interested in and um at that time, since I was such a late bloomer when it came to baseball, I didn't really have many offers. Um, I did get an offer from Miami Dade South, but come find out later that everybody got a scholarship there. They were bringing like 50 something people and oh wow, and then they cut it down to 22 and then red shirt you or cut you or whatever. But um, uh, I knew that because I didn't have that many uh, offers or any interest really, I I would tell my coach, hey, let's go call this coach and let's go call this school. And so through a, a number of phone calls, we he, and he would call on my behalf and I would grab him. Hey, let's call this school. Let's call that school. And eventually, like I said, Miami Day South offered me a scholarship. And then so I was like, all right, cool. I'll go do that. Uh, but after the fall, I realized that. Um, Again, like I, I find myself with like 50 guys for a 22-man yeah. roster. Yeah. And then I was like, well, uh, I want to play. I, I'm not going to rest here. I, 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 I always to- told myself I have a small window to do this. If it doesn't work out, I'm going to the military, whatever, you know. Um, so, again, went back to my high school coach. He helped me make some other phone calls. And then I found uh, Central Florida Community College in Ocala needed an outfielder. And so I transferred there. And. Uh, I mean, from the minute I stepped in there, I, I started hitting. And so just before two Not years, there, yeah. I hit 400 and, and there it went. But uh, I guess the, the, the lesson that I would tell all the kids, don't, don't take for granted that people are going to be knocking down your door and come chase after you. There's millions of kids that are just as good as you or better. So your, your chances are that you're better off doing your own homework making your own phone calls, uh, knocking on doors because, um, you know, it, it's, it's just, that's just the way it is, you know, yeah, you know, and, something you got to go after it yourself. And it was, uh, you know, not to say that we had it harder in our day. Of course, everybody wants to say that, but you know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have sizzle yeah. reels that we could just shoot over an email to people. Uh, you know, you really didn't have any kind of publications that came out so nobody really knew about you as much as yeah. they do today right today if you have talent somebody's going to find you but 
you know, you, I, you just from a statistic standpoint, you know, 8% of kids are going to play from high school to college, right? And that includes Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, and NAIA. So you're right. I mean, you know, unless you're on that upper echelon of people who just have this crazy natural ability and, and, and coaches are going to find that these days, then you got to go out and do the legwork like you talked about. And, and you know, it, it, even though it's not the same as it was back then, you still got to do the same thing as you did back then, which is go out and reach them first and, and try to find the right fit. And it sounds like, you know, it, it, you didn't even find it the first time, you found it the second time. And then once you did find the right fit, then you then you excelled because you felt comfortable or you know whatever the situation turned out right and and so that that's a really cool lesson to be learned there yeah you're right yeah. well a couple of things kind of through that story so num number one i went to a place that i could play that was that was that's another thing that i've seen a lot of kids make them make the mistake of they have this dream school and they right. want to go to the dream school but if you're not playing i promise you it's not going to be fun Exactly. If you're if you are an ambitious athlete and you find yourself on the bench, it's not going to be fun. I've never known anybody to be on the bench and say, oh, this is so much fun. Just sitting here <laughs> practicing every day and cheering everybody else on. Find a place where you can play. And then if you play, then you'll know how good you are. And then you then you can continue and pursue your dreams. Right. But your, your dreams are not going to be fulfilled by going to the dream school. Your dreams are going to be fulfilled by playing and actually putting up numbers and excelling. I've also known people that are like, oh, I want to go to the school. Okay, well, what are your statistics? You don't have the numbers to go to a place like that. Right. You don't have the you don't have the, the the talent to go to a place like that. Go to a lower division school or a junior college and start and and find out for yourself how good you are. Yeah. Uh, so that that's that's one thing. And then the other thing, how I ended up in Tennessee, I had a girlfriend at the time who helped me type up letters. And I, we, we sent letters to all the SEC schools and Florida State. And, um, and through that, that's how I reached Tennessee. And then one day at practice, I got a call. Uh, my, my assistant coach called me in saying that Tennessee wanted to talk to me and wanted to offer me a scholarship. And that's how I reached Tennessee, through a letter that I wrote with my girlfriend at the time. Wow, yeah, that's a great lesson. I didn't know that either, man. That's that's cool, yeah. So, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there there is this and I've talked about it with, uh, with somebody else the other day that there's this gloss about division one, like everybody needs to go to division one, mm -hmm. you know, schools, but you know, this day and age, again, just because there's so much media accessibility and there's so much uh, 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 coverage of people and easier to see that, you know, you can go to any, any level and, and excel. And if you can excel there, then you're going to, you, somebody's going to see that, you know, back in the day, they might not have seen you at a division three school just because, you know, it was so remote or so small, but that these days are over. So you're right. I think there has to be some realistic, you know, kind of come to Jesus talks with yourself. Like, you know, if, if you're hitting 215 and you're a second baseman with a great glove, you're probably not going to get recruited by Vanderbilt. Uh, but, but you may be able to go to Gulf coast college or somebody, you know, different like that, that that's more, in your in your comfort zone yeah yeah i mean i think i think kids today um they they get influenced so much by social media and what what their friends are doing oh i committed to this school i committed to that school i mean my, my daughter went through that and I, and I tried to uh advise her through that but she still ended up making the same mistake waiting on everybody to call her you know like she went through her dream school well she spent three years not playing, even though, you know, she graduated, but it, 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 and it was hard. She didn't, she didn't enjoy it, uh, not playing. So uh, I really, I really, I can't stress that enough that you're not going to enjoy being on a team if you can't play, if you're not, if you're not playing. Yeah. So when you, when you got to Tennessee, it sounds like pretty early on. Well, well first off you went to Tennessee and then what after that, where, where did you go? Did you, you, do you, what 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 was next? Yeah, well, I uh, I got drafted after my senior year, and then I I played for the Cardinals for a couple of seasons. Uh, I re I got released from that from them, and then I went to um, Independent Ball. Independent Ball is pretty cutthroat, so it's just kind of a hard thing. That was another situation, kind of like uh, like Miami Dade. I I show up and there's 50 guys for a 22 man roster. I got 10 at bats and 
that was it. <laughs> they cut me. Uh, and then I tried one more time in spring training with the Brewers. And at that time, just my heart wasn't in it. My body wasn't responding. And so I was like, well, at that time I was already married and getting to an age where, you know, I, I, I need to make a decision here. Otherwise, um, I'm, I don't want to be that 28 year old guy in double A, you know? Yeah. 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 I totally get that. But it sounds like early on you were into the whole strength and conditioning thing. So how did that evolve into where you are now? Or what pathway did you go from there? Yeah, um, you know, like I said, early on as a kid, I wanted muscles. So that was the first thing. Uh, I read a lot about it. So that I, even in high school, I knew muscle names and body parts and uh, workout programs and exercises. So I, I knew quite a bit going into high school. And then... Uh, uh, I, it, I also through that I trained myself to be faster like I, I was able to figure out how to how to become faster by using resisted um, running plyometrics jumping uh, so through my reading I, I figured out how to how to train to be faster so I got faster I I remember uh, running a four or five on the 40 and and wow. at, at Tennessee we, we had that indoor facility with turf I remember yeah. uh couple of times I ran a six, three, six, four on turf. Um, so I, you know, I was getting results, getting bigger, getting faster. Um, so I knew that it worked. So I, I always knew that it made me better. And so when I was done playing, uh, again, I didn't know what kind of jobs were out there, what kind of things I could do. And then I took a few, jobs in between selling phones and doing things that I hated I was just like man I, I, I gotta do something that I am passionate about and exercise I thought you know exercise is the one thing that's always been with me and so I um uh, talked to a few people that I that I that I know about like were either physical therapists or strength or uh, strength coaches and um I knew that I had to get postgraduate work or a degree and so everybody recommended go to physical therapy school. And so I was like, all right. So figured out um, how to do that. I realized I didn't have the grades in certain classes. So I had to take some classes, chemistry and physics over. Mm -hmm. and got into physical therapy school at Nova Southeastern University in, in Davie, Florida. Went there for two years. And then when I came back to Tennessee, uh, there was a guy, man, where is can't remember his name right now anyways friend of ours used to be an umpire non-sec umpire at tennessee so I, I can't remember his name right now but he had a baseball school that he was starting and then he asked my father-in-law if i was interested in coaching a team 12 year old team and i was like well sure whatever and so i started coaching that team and i saw that there was a weight room in that building and i and there was a guy starting a little business and the owner said hey why don't you get together with him and and try to figure out how to do this because he doesn't have the schooling or the experience you do um so i thought well this will be cool and so i started coaching the kids training the kids and i realized hmm i need to i need to learn more so i started um going to a lot of seminars uh reaching out to people that i read about um i've always been a big reader when i'm interested in something i read a lot about it I don't like to read just to read, but I like to read whatever, whatever I'm passionate about. I'll, I'll research as much as I can about it. And I've always been, I've never been afraid to pursue people, call them out of the blue. Hey, look, I'm so-and-so. I read your book. I want to learn from you. What do you got? Um, so I, I was doing that a lot. That's cool. And then in uh, 2001, Tom House had a a pitching clinic at Webb High School in Knoxville. I was helping coach them, and um, and so he uh, he and I struck up a conversation, and he said, "Coach, how do you know all these exercises?" I'm like, well, I'm not actually a coach. I'm just part time coach, but I'm a physical therapist and personal trainer, and I played a little bit. And so I told him my background. He goes, "Man, and you speak Spanish?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I do." And he said, um, wow, you'd be great for Major League Baseball. And I thought, nah, sure, whatever. You know, I'm like, this guy's just kind of blowing smoke. But um, I sent him my resume and, and we stayed in touch. A few months later, 
I get a call from the hitting coach from the Mets. Hey, uh, send me your resume. I'm going to give it to Bobby Valentine. Nice. I'm going to push it through and uh, I'll get back to you. Well, this is around July of 2001. Okay. You know, obviously 9-11 happened in September. So, you know, oh, wow. I, I didn't hear anything for several months. And then um, early October, middle of October, I got a call from the GM from the Mets asking me if I was interested in interviewing. And I went up there and I I got the job as the assistant strength coach. Cool. And, and so I've been and then I've been doing it ever since. So you've been with either the Mets or the Rangers or was there any yeah. stop in between? Yeah. yeah. So I started with the Mets and I was there for four years as the assistant. And okay. then I came here. I came here in 2005 as the head guy. Wow. Yeah. And I've been here ever since. Wow, man. That's great. That's great. And so as a strength and conditioning coach, which I just found out today, you travel with the team and, and you're constantly talk, working with dudes to to keep them in, in top shape as even as they're playing uh, after spring training, you know, you're, you're with them all the, all the, on the road all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so what, what is like a major league, uh, I mean, what what do you what do you recommend as they are working out during the year and they're playing during the year? What what's does it red is it a um uh it's probably a little different than in the off season, right? In spring training, you probably change the regiments around. Yeah. Um, so you know, during the season, the, the you have to be very strategic um mm -hmm. because they play every day. Now you can still work for, uh, you can still maintain strength. You can still build strength. Uh, what you have to do is be very, very uh, specific to what you need and also keep it really short. Mm -hmm. the, the number one thing that I keep telling, uh, I try to stress to, to any player is usually if we think about weight training, just not just to keep it simple. Uh, usually most people will do the big lifts, bench press, deadlift squats mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. That's what most people do. And everybody, a lot of times people say, oh, I can't do that in season because it makes me sore. Well, the, the best way to get the most benefit out of that is keep the repetitions between three to five repetitions, two to three sets. Um, go as heavy as you can as you can at that time, because if you go heavy, you're always going to have strength. If you keep it light by the time by the time you hit July, you're going to be weak. You're going to be tired. So mm -hmm. the whole idea of weight training during the season is to stimulate the body, not necessarily to make gains. And so the way the body works, if you stimulate it with heavy enough weight, that strength carries through through the season. If you mm -hmm. don't lift heavy enough, you're going to get weak throughout the baseball season. Baseball is the type of sport that makes you weaker throughout the season because right. it's so long right. and everything is kind of slow and, and everything is is – there's a lot of breaks in between and a lot of travel, a lot of things. So if you don't stress the body enough, uh, you lose it. And so the best way to stress the body is lift as heavy as you can, but keep it very short because you don't have, it doesn't affect you. You recover in an hour or so, and that's it. It's gone. Hmm. I always, I always try to, the best way I can explain it is if I tell you to do a hundred squats in five minutes, Versus I tell you to do a hundred squats in three hours, the, the, the five minute 100, that's going to, that's going to make you sore. That's going to have, have a hot greater impact than, um, than a hundred squats in three hours. Or I'll, 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 I'll tell you, I'll pick up this 300 pound weight one time versus do 150 pounds, 10 times that right. 150 pounds, 10 times creates more soreness than for you to lift that, that weight one time, to, you know, for 300 pounds so the key is and people are always people always misunderstand heavy lifting with muscle mass heavy lifting with soreness it's the opposite muscle mass and soreness is created in the rep range of eight to 12 repetitions hmm. so like if you work your legs in that rep range you're going to get sore but if you do some heavy squats two to three sets of three reps your, your, your body will wake up and you won't feel anything in a couple hours hmm. and, and you keep that going. And my recommendation is two to three times a week of that. Um, in, in my experience, I've had some really, really good players 
get really, really good results from that. Uh, also, another question that comes up is, should I lift before the game? Now, my answer is yes. Weight training should be a stimulus. It shouldn't be a, a beatdown. People always misunderstand working out and training. Training is when you, you know, when you do a specific thing, like playing catch, taking ground balls. I, I do. I like to think that I do training. Working out is you go down the CrossFit gym down the road and get your butt kicked and sweat like crazy. That's a workout. Mm -hmm. What I try what I try to tell people, I train, I train you to be explosive. I train you to be strong. I train you to move better. And that requires more focus, less volume, which means less repetitions and a lot of intensity. So I want to, I'm going to push you as heavy as you can, but I'm going to keep it very, very short so that your, your brain just feels the intensity, but it shuts back down and then you just move on and you can continue to do your thing. So, wow. That's um, interesting, man. I had no idea. So, so is that, that's position players, obviously, I guess pitchers would be different. Only starting pitchers, starting pitchers obviously won't, yeah. they won't lift before they pitch, but, uh, but yeah, relievers lift before the game. Really? Okay. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. Same yeah, concept. What? Same concept. I mean, they throw before the game. They yeah. always throw, so it's the same thing. If you treat it the same, you're training throwing, right? So, and you're training, you're training your legs, you're training jumping, you're training core, whatever. So you just got to keep it specific and short. Do you do like a combination of plyometrics and lifting and, and jumping, or is it just strictly lifting during the year? It's a combination. Um, depending on the month. Uh, when we get out of spring training, I try to keep it just strength. You know, mm -hmm. that's still getting their their getting loose, their loot the because in the in in the off season and spring training, they're still somewhat tight, a little tense from all the uh weight training they've done in the off season. So in uh in April I kind of keep it strength based. Then in and in, in May I become I start adding jumping. And then now we're, we're we're entering the third month. We do a lot of fast movements, a lot of speed, velocity work. Uh because now we're beginning to should be getting into a little bit of fatigue. We've been traveling a lot, we've played a lot. Uh so now I try to keep the movements really fast so that it wakes up the body and it doesn't it doesn't um it, it allows for them to recover a little bit better so and, i kind of phase it out i do it in phases right so and then and so as you add that on that helps with the longevity and and, and kind of the the ability to to make it through push through the you know august and september months yeah kind of building into that mm -hmm. yeah yeah you always have to keep it uh the body always adapts to the total work not necessarily like month to month but if you just keep working Right. Your body's going to adapt to all the different things that you put it through. Uh, you know, the key is to have a good relationship with the player so that he's honest with you about what they did the night before, you know, whether they, whether they were not drinking, whether the, the baby kept them up or whatever. So right. it, it uh, all those things to kind of, you have to consider their lifestyle. Yeah. And, but also, uh, and then you try to match that with, with the lifting and, and with what else going on you know we travel we got in at four o'clock in the morning and your workout is tomorrow perhaps you don't do it give it get another day so uh it's just a it's a combination of factors but most of it most of it i really really believe is just having the best relationship you can with the player because um it, that's how you know whether they're recovering or not and so i i again i'm going to try to delineate but between position players and relievers, obviously, you have you feel like that's the workout for them. Let's mm -hmm. go to starting pitchers. Mm -hmm. What 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 is the, are they doing more of the higher reps versus the 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 intense weight, or what what's your philosophy there? Uh, well, the 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 way I look at it, or the way it is, uh, there are certain muscles that respond better to high repetition, low weight. And there are some muscles that respond better to high weight, low reps. So it's kind of start there. Um, so when it comes to the arm, the arm, the rotator cuff muscles, scapular muscles, all those muscles of the shoulder, for the most part, they all respond to higher reps and lower intensity. So lifting heavy bench and doing stuff like that doesn't really help a pitcher. Um, but you still want to work the, the chest muscles for strength, but also for endurance. 
so that they they, they stay healthier. Um, so when it comes to starting pitching, you you combine all the things because they got four days, four or five days to recover. Right. So you you create a comp a workout and you combine all these things so that you know you got to have arm care. You got to have some sort of exercise uh, uh, session where you're flushing out a lot of the soreness and you're and you're getting through a lot of the uh, the soreness that you built up from the day before. You still have to be explosive, so you got to do some plyometrics. You got to you got to your legs got to remain strong, so you got to do the heavy lifting like everybody else does. So it's a combination of everything because they got more time to recover. And when they do play, it's they're out there for a hundred and something pitches. So right. uh, it's it's a combination of all of it. Whereas so, the position players and relievers, everything else is a lot shorter and con and, and concise. I remember as a, as a starting pitcher, I mean, and, and the knowledge we had back in the late eighties, early nineties was nothing, but, but we did a lot of uh, long distance running or, you know, the, so the endurance for the legs, right. I mean, like you said, you're out there hundred plus pitches sometimes, is that still a, a recommended thing? I mean, people, you know, have pitchers running poles and stuff like that, or is that too old school? Uh, well, the answer is no, we don't do that anymore. We don't, we don't, we don't, uh, go by that, that that trend um i really believe this is and this is my personal opinion everybody has their 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 opinions on this and and to this day nobody's proven to me what is the ideal way to condition a pitcher right i have right. had so many pitchers come come through my the years that everybody it's almost like as if they all do it different but at the end of the day the reason they're here is because they're talented not because of the workout program so right. I'll, I'll say that right um uh, in the old days, I think the reason people ran is, number one, they didn't know any better. Number two, there wasn't as much equipment available and information, you know, uh, that back then all you could do is maybe do a little bit of abs, some shoulder work and running. But now there's so many options, you know, you you, you do, uh, there's so many machines and, and gadgets and, and, and equipment and and there's more understanding about all these other things that you can do to substitute the uh, distance running. So what I've adopted is, and I still subscribe to, you have to have some sort of form of exercise that is very, very low intensity, uh, continuous, so that your muscle, your body flushes out the soreness. Mm -hmm. And that's why where flushing comes from. When you do boxers, other athletes, they still have that that long run you know that they there's a specific uh physiological purpose for that is if you keep the intensity low and it's con and it's um it's uh continuous you get a lot of blood flow you pitched yesterday you're very sore you're not going to have the energy to do a very high intensity run so right. if you keep it really really low intensity you'd get on the treadmill you get on the elliptical uh, one of the things that I like to do that I've incorporated is do a, a light total body circuit. So we do bands and sit-ups and jump rope and stretching and uh, hurdles. And, and I keep them moving light, ex light intensity exercises for 30 minutes. I get the same cardiovascular effect as a uh, long distance run. And for some guys, that's even more beneficial because I can incorporate flexibility, mobility, uh, agility training jump training and keep it all body weight based and but just keep them moving uh for 30 minutes get their heart rate up to a certain level and get the same effect as a 30 minute run or poles or whatever uh so what we what we've done or what i've done a lot of that long distance running has been replaced with circuit training and different other things and i feel like in today's game pitchers lift more they do more weight training they do more work in the weight room and i feel like at the end of the day it's all about increasing work capacity so does it really matter if it's a 30 minute run or is it a 30 minute lift yeah uh, so I, I feel like people get caught up in what we used to do or what is right what is wrong for me it boils down to two two things increasing the player's work capacity and if he performs doing that, then that's what it is. Right. You know, results, like, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, uh, when people say, well, what is your program? Oh, it depends on the player. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So, it, because I got players that got to, who are 
six foot four, 230 pounds, if I tell that guy to run 30, uh, 30 minutes, it's going to hurt his back. But <laughs> right. if I, if I have him do a cardio circuit with yeah. me, and move him through a bunch of range of motion exercises, but I get his heart rate up. Not only do I make him more athletic, but I'm still getting the same cardiovascular effect. So, you know, for me to say, oh, my, my program day one is, ah, they run cardio. Yeah. Well, that could be it, but it could, that, that cardio could come from a lot of different forms. And so hmm. that's, that's where people get caught up. And what exactly do you do? Well, it depends. It depends on who I got. You know, is it, is it a 25 year old kid that just came out of college or is it is it a veteran guy that's 33 years old or is it a, uh, a guy that is always hurt? It depends. So you got to so, personalize it to, to yeah. agree. Yeah. So that, that, that makes sense because honestly, I mean, you know, like I said, we, I didn't know how to take care of myself back when I was playing, but when I finished, I really got into, you know, weightlifting and working out and figuring it all out and nothing benefited me more than what you're talking about is the cardio circuit workout. I mean, I would be done in 30 minutes, just drenched and wet, but I'd have a great workout and my heart rate was up. And, and so, you know, that, that was a, a great workout for me. So, let's while we're on the subject let's dial it back and say well well what what would be your recommendation for high school kids uh in terms of weightlifting and like when does when do you ramp it up when do you start you know that kind of thing yeah um well i, I think high school kids number one you got to consider uh the, what we some people call the training age meaning how much experience do they have you know you you know my son is 13 years old and he's a beam pole, but he can lift, you know, he knows how to do the exercises. So he, he has good technique. So if, if you have a kid that is mature and you have a kid that can do the exercises correctly, then that's someone that you can progress through and put them in certain exercises that uh, require a little bit more, more focus. Now, if it's a guy like a kid that can't chew gum and, and tie shoes, then you have to do it a little different. Uh, that would be my first thing. Just, you got to consider, again, you got to consider who you, who you got, uh, because when it comes to weightlifting, those Olympic lifters that are lifting in the Olympics, those, those people started when they were six, seven years old doing light sticks and developing the technique. And then eventually they put weight on the bar. Uh, so the same thing with this. So you consider who you have. And when it comes to that, it, it, the other thing is have the right expectations in high school. Uh, a lot of times people think that when they start lifting, they're going to start growing muscle. And, and when they don't get muscle, then they got to do more and they got to do more and they got to do supplements and they got to do things. And that's what, how they get. Sometimes some of these high school kids get in trouble with steroids because their body's not, their testosterone is not there yet. And, and you're probably not going to, you know, some kids grow faster than others. So weight training in high school is not about gaining muscle as it is to gain coordination and strength. You can gain strength and coordination without showing any kind of muscle size. Muscle building, muscle hypertrophy is something that is also specific to how you do the workout. Like we were talking about earlier, if I want to work on strength, I'm going to do squats, multiple sets of three to five repetitions. If I want to gain muscle size, well, I'm going to do multiple sets of eight to 12 repetitions. I'm not going to lift as heavy and I'm going to work on going slow and going in a very, very methodical but if I do that with a high school kid, what he's going to get is a lot of soreness and he's probably not going to gain muscle. Mm. So you you have to understand that the way you do the exercises, the, the sets and the reps and the rest are the most important things for the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And in my opinion, for high school kids, they should work on strength and, and strength and coordination for me kind of goes hand in hand because if you are coordinated in the lift you're going to be able to put more weight on the bar you're going to be able to lift heavier is right. that going to make you bigger muscles no but it uh it is it is part of uh i believe it's a good entry level way of doing weights i believe it's also the way that you should lift in season um and also if you want it but if you want to gain muscle i still i still feel like you're you're uh, at the mercy of your genetics right and so but anyways like just to kind of give also some parameters in season i still think that you should lift two total body lifts a week off season you can work out four days a week mm -hmm. um and when it comes to the lifts i still believe that bench press squat deadlift 
are, are still the main lifts that everybody should master. That doesn't mean that you have to be an Olympic bench presser or an Olympic squatter, but you should do those lifts. Uh, you should, the, at the end of the day, when people talk about workouts for, uh, let's just say, general health, you got you got to look at the functional movements that all human beings do. We push, we pull, we squat, we bend at the waist, and and, and then we we lunge. You know, we have to move locomotion. So every every workout for an athlete should include some of that stuff: a pushing movement like bench press movements, a pulling movement like pull ups, slap pull downs, that kind of stuff, a, a squatting movement, a hinging movement, and, and some kind of lunging movement, step ups, lunges, that kind of stuff. Beyond that, everything else is just dressing, kind of gravy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's some foundational basic functional movements that all human beings have to be able to do. We sit down, we're squatting. When I'm trying to get over a, a rock, I'm lunging. I'm throwing a baseball, I'm pushing, and I'm pulling. If I reach a cabinet, I'm going to pull something. You know, so like, uh, oh, that's, that's the way that high school coaches, high school kids, high school parents should think about their workouts you know are you doing all those four foundational movements in your workout if you if you are you're heading you're heading somewhere um also there's exercises that i prefer to do them heavy so my i prefer to do them light like the squats i prefer to do them heavy you know get get some foundational strength in your legs for baseball players i don't i don't promote heavy chest why i mean i i personally lived it where I, I can bench press a lot, but then I couldn't throw the baseball. Yeah. So um, it, it, that's that's the thing that you have to understand. If if I, even my guys, oh, but I love this exercise, but this exercise hurts you. What if if it hurts you and it keeps you from playing baseball? Why do you want to do it? Oh, it's a good exercise. Well, but it's not letting you play. Right. So it, it doesn't matter. Like if 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 bench press bothers your throwing, then don't do bench press. Yeah. I mean, I have baseball players, I have position players that would do bench press with the bar and. And still play and throw and not a big deal. But then there are guys that they touch a bar and their chest gets real stiff and then they can't throw and it hurts them. Like, okay, well, don't do do don't do it. Do yeah. push up, do dumbbells. Yeah. I don't know. Uh that's that's the other thing. Sometimes kids and people see videos, oh, I gotta do that exercise. Well, that exercise is not good for you. Is 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 it you always no matter what you do, you always have to ask yourself, is this helping me play baseball? If if, we, if the answer is yes, okay, then keep doing it and figure out a way to adapt it depending on how you feel. But if it doesn't help you play baseball, why are you doing it? Right. You know, do you want to be an exerciser or do you want to be a baseball player? Yeah, especially if it's your profession, right? I mean, it's one, yeah. you, can, you can go be a big buff dude after you're done playing, right? But, it, you know, while you're playing, you got your contract, you got your money, you got your family, think of, you know, you know, yeah. be, be wise with that, I guess, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to dial one, one more back and then we'll move on to something else. Uh, what do you think is like, you know, we, we talked about high school kids two or three times a week, maybe two times a week while they're playing, four times a week while they're not playing, stick with the core exercises, uh, bench, squat, deadlift, uh, pull downs, that kind of thing. What about, I mean, cause you know, everybody wants to be buff now. So like kids before high school, like where, where do you start with that? And, and just, you don't have to go deep into it, but like, where, what's your basic platform there for that? Do you have one philosophy? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I think, I think in kids in, in elementary school, they should know how to do push ups, do a body weight squat, learn how to bend at the hips. And, and if, if they can like learn how to do pull ups, uh, the basic exercises, pull ups, push ups, squats, some kind of sit up. Dips. Uh, my son's been doing, yeah. My son's been doing, push-ups and sit-ups and things like pull-ups since he was two years old you know wow. just because i want i wanted you know he's i want him to move well yeah. and you know so it, those are the things that our people need to do every everyone you know like men today can't even do a pull-up so uh i feel like start them with that and and then as as they mature and you see that they can't handle a bar or a dumbbell or whatever then yeah you start adding those things but as soon as you can, start making them do push-ups. Yeah, very so, basic core stuff, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because, I mean, my nephew, and, and I know this happens a lot, and some people kind of get worried about it and start, you know, panicking a little bit, but my, my nephew is going to be a junior at Catholic High School. He's a left-handed pitcher and, and first baseman. 
but he's a beanpole, right? And he, he and not and Cooper. If you're listening to this, I don't mean that. But I mean he's. They've always been very cognizant of the fact that he's not. You can't ever put on weight. And I'm like, guys, just wait. At 19, 18, 19, he's gonna boom. All of a sudden, he's just gonna yeah. fill out, and everything's gonna be fine, right? And so I think there's a lot of people in that world that they're just like, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna put on weight. Uh, you know. Where do you see that happen a lot? Do you, 16, 17, 18? Is that when it usually yeah. is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's high school. High school is a big is a big deal. There's an organization, uh, the Don Hooten Foundation, that it, it started because this guy's son was told in high school that he needed to put on weight. So he started doing steroids and then he committed suicide. Oh, wow. And so uh, and this foundation started because of that. And they go all over the world preaching to high school kids about the dangers of steroids. And that's the problem with with baseball. You know, we want bigger, faster, stronger. And we put thoughts in people's heads about what they should look like at an age that perhaps um, their genetics are not there. And so I I believe that my, my message to anyone, any coach, any parent, any kid that finds himself in that situation, instead of putting in their head to get bigger how about you tell them to get stronger just keep just keep lifting take care if you're a pitcher take care of your arm right you know take care of your arm there's a lot of good shoulder programs take care of your arm do a good sound um throwing program make sure you when you work on pitching you're throwing strikes you're working on location not velocity uh but and get your legs as strong as possible eventually eventually your your genetics will take over it and and i know it, it's easy to say and it's you know the day-to-day pressure of getting bigger and stronger and all that stuff it, it's I, I get it i get it but yeah. but if you get influenced by that gaining weight thing uh it, number one is going to drive you crazy and number two is not possible it, right. it's just it's just not possible you, you can't you can't speed up genetics what you can speed up is strength right you, you can work on strength and you can get bit you can get stronger and yeah. still be skinny there's a lot of skinny strong dudes there's a lot of guys that are six foot four 200 pounds in the big leagues that throw 99 right you know and they look like bean poles and yeah. they take off their shirt and they're like oh my gosh you play baseball yeah, you know no so right. yeah but you know it, that 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 kind of message hurts kids is in my opinion yeah i'm glad you touched on that man because it is it's a you know the the mental strain and the and the emotional strain it takes on kids unnecessarily right i mean mm-hmm. so that's that's great i mean that's that's exactly what i wanted to get to and so now that now let's switch to hey you've obviously seen hundreds of guys come and go through major league baseball now and those guys are already you know, I, I'm a big believer in the bell curve, right? And so, you know, you're talking about the two or three percent at the end of the bell curve that are playing in Major League Baseball now. It's the mental game that, that separates them at that point, right? I mean, I'm sure you've seen some physical specimens come and go that you're like, oh my God, this guy's going to, you know, just crush it here. And and perhaps they don't pan out. So, I mean, what what do you, do you guys, do you have an emphasis or you, I mean, maybe it's not right down your lane, but the 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 mental aspect of the game what do you guys do there yeah uh well as a matter of fact i'm sitting in the mental skills coach's office right now. <laughs> that's so, cool so we, we promote that um obviously the mental health uh, issue is a big one um you know in sport in the world it seems to be front and center nowadays um so now even though i, I believe that there's there's a uh there's a focus on that and you got to focus on it it's important i also want to make sure that you you, every time you struck out and you you're struggling oh i got mental health issues you know so it's like i I don't want to make light of it but sometimes i feel like athletes overdo it a little bit right um because when it comes to baseball the best ones the best ones i've seen are the ones that can put their failure behind them quicker than others right they strike out they, they they drop a few f bombs, they drop the bat, whatever. Go sit down, go back out, play defense. I'm gonna get them next time. I'm gonna get this guy. And so, w- when it boils down to success in in sport, how quickly can you recover from your last failure? The bounce back, yeah. 
right? Yeah. And, and that's, if there's one thing that I can say, that is the one thing that I have observed because everybody at, at this level does it differently. They all prepare differently. They all focus differently. They all have different opinions on what mental health and mental focus is. Uh, some guys really believe in mental coaches. Some guys don't even want anything to do with them. Um, you know, so like the, the opinions on mental health in baseball, it, they're all over the place. Right. Uh, everybody has a different opinion. I, I can only tell you and speak on the Hall of Famers that I've seen. Mm -hmm. When those guys strike out, for the most part, those guys put the bat back down and they're like, I'm going to get you next time. And then they go play defense. Yeah. The pitcher that that I remember, I always remember Tom Glavin. He always, no matter what happened in that game, you know, he'd get mad after the game a little bit. Go do his post game stuff. The next four days, same workout. Nothing changed. He right. just went right back at it. Uh, so you know, I've had like he's always been my my number one example of someone who always kept it steady. Uh, yeah. Just so he he got yeah he got mad as any you know he got pissed when he didn't pitch well but right you know after that after the game you know he have his little moment and then he would get over it and next day come right back to work. Yeah. Uh, and so that's that's the number one thing that that I I observed. Mm -hmm. Now my recommendation, you know, like I think that this is it goes hand in hand. Everyone who cares and who wants to get better is going to get upset. Okay, what I recommend is that you get to know yourself and that how how uh, when bad things happen to you, how upset you get. You know, like some people handle it differently. Just right. get to know yourself. What what are your triggers? What are the things that really, really like drive you crazy? And then once you figure that out, then, okay, how quickly can I get over this? Because the quicker that I get over this, the quicker I can figure out what I did wrong and I can correct it for the next, next time. Right. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot, there's something that I try to teach my son all the time is like, if you get really, really upset and you spent so, a lot of time upset, and hanging on to your anger and your disappointment, you you can't think about why you missed that pitch, you know? So you sometimes in order for you to learn from your failures, you have to have a clear head. Well, in order for you to have a clear head, you gotta you, you gotta get your feelings under control, get your, your anger under control, and then so you can focus on what you did wrong so you can learn from it. Otherwise, you're not you're not gonna get anywhere. And so and that and that's what happens. And I, I remember I was guilty of it. I would just I would carry that feeling for days, for days. And then instead of focusing on what I could do, I was just still upset, trying to fix it, but also upset. So I'm carrying these two thoughts, how to fix my swing and and still upset and and the confusion. And, and it would take me forever so sometimes to get out of my funk. Yeah. But when the guys, these guys here, that's what they do. They can get out of that funk a lot quicker. And think through it like, okay, my hip was, or my swing, or the he got me with the fastball, whatever. And so, like, the brain can only handle so many things, and the brain is always going to hang on to the negative stuff. So if you're upset, down on yourself, mad, depressed, whatever, the quicker you can get over that, the quicker you can get back to work and go work on whatever it is that you failed at. And so my recommendation to all young athletes, know your triggers, what, what makes you upset, and once you know that, how quickly can you recover for that so you can go to work? Right. Get back to get back to practice, get back to doing what you what you you know did that, wrong. That's that that emotional detachment is what you write. You need because yeah. everybody's emotional, right? You get upset. How can I detach from that emotion and know that that's part of the game? I mean, because think about it to, to me, I mean, the framework of of baseball, especially. I mean, all sports, but baseball especially, they reward the person who fails the least. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you hit 300, you're you're considered a great hitter. That means you missed seven out of 10 times. Right. If you mm -hmm. give up three runs, you know, you're, you're considered a great pitcher. But that's giving up three runs. I mean, a lot of people want to be perfect. And that's that's where you kind of get out of that mind frame and you lose your perspective and, and, and you know, things can spiral the other way. But, yeah, I really that really makes sense. You know, just being able, again, I call it the bounce back. How fast can you bounce back from from the last thing? And that's that. And that 
that means like letting go of the anger, letting go of the, of the sadness, letting go of the shame, getting to go of the guilt. You know, there's there's those five stages of grief, you know, that you've got to go through as fast as you possibly can. And so you can get into the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the key is recognize that we all go through that and, it, and it's normal. Mm -hmm. You're not any worse than anybody else. Yeah. Some, you may do different things than everybody else, but like everybody gets upset. If you want to be good at something, you're going to get upset at some, at some point. So know yourself. It, but it's a worthwhile cause to figure out how to get how to bounce back how you do it it's plenty of books plenty of people plenty of ways but it, i feel like it's a worthwhile pursuit something that i didn't re recognize and realize at my time because i didn't really understand what that was how to get over that stuff yeah and, and, but now that i've seen these guys and worked with them and helped a lot of guys with stuff like that over the years and now have a son that wants to be a baseball player so being able to explain that it's normal. It's worthwhile working on it. it, it it's just like everything else. You got to work on it. Everything can be worked on if you're intentional about it. And so figure out how, how, how quickly can I bounce back? What kind of habits, thoughts, words, cues, whatever, can right. I come up with myself to bounce back? So that that's be my recommendation. Cool. Well, that's a lot of good stuff in a short amount of time, man. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate you know, a great journey to where it is you got to, you know, the the perspective that you have on on weightlifting. Obviously, Texas is having a great year this year. So kudos to you. I mean, you've, you've kept those guys in shape and everybody's, you know, knock on wood, pretty healthy. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, just just your your overall uh, perspective in everything, man. So that's that's been really cool, man. I appreciate you joining. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I hope yeah. Uh... Hope uh, somebody gets something out of this. I always, I always like to do these things. I yeah. don't do too many of them. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a self promoter. I don't, I don't. Right. I, I just like to coach. I like to help play people. I like to help the players. I, I'm not, I don't put myself too much out there, you know. But when I do this, I, I, I hope and I always pray that somebody got something good out of it. So. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. I think they will. I, I know they will because you know you you're in a position where people need to listen to what you're saying because you're at a place where, you know, you've your hard work and your dedication and your understanding of personalizing people's workouts, which is what's very important, right? Not everybody can fit into a barrel mm -hmm. uh, is, is really uh, valuable. Well, so, good. Thanks, Jose, man. Take care of yourself. Right, yeah. Thank you. Take care. Yep. See you, bud. Right. See you. Bye.